Thank you all for joining us. I assume you're all here to hear about cybercrime. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, so Larry and I are here from At Bay. At Bay is uh, the world's first InsureSec provider. So some of you here might be familiar with the InsureTech conference. Sorry, a concept that's been around for the last couple of years, uh, where we have technology disrupting insurance and making it easier, cheaper, better, faster, etc. Um, At Bay has recently introduced this concept of the InsureSec, where our primary product is actually a cyber breach insurance product uh, down in the states where we are based. Uh, and we include security along with our insurance. So if you think about it, they actually go together pretty well. Um, if we're gonna sell you insurance that you use in case you get breached, uh, we have a strong incentive to also be good at security so that we get to keep more of the money that people give us and you know make sure that people have fewer breaches, that kind of thing. Um, so the perspective that we're gonna be offering you today is uh, really focused quite a bit on our data and our lessons learned as a company. So. You read a lot in the news, um, you know, the last couple of years pretty much everybody has a reporter doing technology and cyber stories. Um, Forbes is a pretty common one. I never thought I would see uh, Forbes, you know, the magazine of finance and stock trades and stuff like that, talking about cybersecurity. Um, they also have video game reviews now, if you're into that kind of thing. Forbes is a video game reporter. But, um, but a lot of what you're reading whenever you read about things like you know, top 10 cyber threats for this year and biggest things to worry about for your business. A lot of that stuff is coming from people who uh, don't necessarily have the objective perspective that an insurance company would. So we're writing the policies, we're paying out claims. Um, each claim we pay has an investigation associated with it. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and so we have a very objective, empirical, and I would say intellectually honest uh, perspective on just where the risks are that small businesses face. Um, so we'll talk through those, but um, some quick introductions. Uh, I'm Adam Tyra, so nice to meet you. I'm the General Manager of Security Services at AtBay. I lead the team of folks that we have that actually deliver all of the security to our uh, 30,000 plus insureds. Um, I've been in security and technology for about 18 years, um, with about half of that spent consulting, primarily focused on security operations. Uh, so security monitoring, incident response, threat intelligence, um, basically all the types of things for cybersecurity that are involved in catching bad guys and booting them out of the network. Um, before I did that, I was a software developer for a couple of years, um, working on, uh, we'll say, security tools for the U.S. defense and intelligence communities. Um, before that, I was in the military. Larry? No, thanks, Adam. I'm Larry Crocker. I'm, uh, I head our incident response and digital forensics practice here at that bank. Uh, I have uh, 31 years experience in uh, incident response and uh, security. I know it doesn't look like I'm being only 29 years old, you know, it's, it's 31 years old. I try. I guess it's my looks. But no, uh, I have been involved uh, with incident response for a long period of time. I've seen a lot of different things and prior to um, starting it, I, I worked with the um, U.S. Army. I was a combat engineer. I uh, got out of the Army and joined um, a, doing incident response and law enforcement. Uh, do a lot of incident response, uh, digital forensics uh, with uh, uh, a company called SecureWorks. So you've probably heard of Dell, Dell SecureWorks doing incident response. I was a global, global director there. And prior to the, uh, after that, I worked for uh, Kivu Consulting where I was the vice president over incident response, counter extortion, and threat intelligence. And now here I'm at, uh, at Bay uh, doing, uh, starting up our uh, incident response practice. Okay, so what exactly are we insuring against when we talk about like cyber crime targeting small and medium sized businesses? Um, everybody's heard about ransomware uh, for the last couple of years. Believe it or not, ransomware actually came from the 1980s, right? The first known instance of ransomware was that long ago. So the, the idea of using encryption uh, to basically destroy data um, was actually an academic idea that was introduced in a white paper way back in the 80s. Um, wasn't really a big threat uh, for a long time. Um, you know, as a security professional, we worried about a lot of stuff, but um, talking about up into the early 2000s, ransomware wasn't really a big thing until um, a couple of things changed uh, in the market. The first one was cryptocurrency. Um, got any cryptocurrency fans here in the room? Nobody wants to admit to it. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, I know you're there. Uh, so what cryptocurrency has done you know, for the world in general is given people the ability to make uh, otherwise untraceable payments, right? Everybody can see the blockchain, but 
Um, you can't see who's sending the money and receiving the money. And if you are a cyber criminal engaging in activity that is 100% illegal, uh, most of the time in places where you're doing it, um, you can't really ask for people to pay you in Visa, right? And Square is not gonna let you start an account. Um, you certainly can't ask to be paid uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in cash. Um, so cryptocurrency was sort of a key enabler there um, starting about 10 years ago. And so now what we see um, is that the majority, the vast majority of uh, cyber attacks that we're seeing are ransomware attacks. Um, and so what do those look like, right? You have malware primarily, piece of ransomware that gets into the environment somehow, um, encrypts data, right? Uh, it's not always what happens, but that's, that's a pretty a common threat tactic. Um, and so that data, if it's your data, if you're a small business, that data is effectively destroyed, right? If it's been encrypted. Um, fun fact, people don't really break encryption, right? In spite of what you see on TV or the movies where, you know, the cool kid hackers and the hoodies are, are like cracking through the encryption. That is not a thing uh, anywhere in the commercial space, um, unless it's so poorly configured that, anyway, we don't even try to do that because it doesn't work, right? So pretty much what you're left with is a situation where um, you have to negotiate uh, with a threat actor, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, and, and essentially pay. Um, you know, we did go through a phase, I think, where people had this, what I would describe as a uh, 1980s action movie mentality of like, oh yeah, we do not negotiate with terrorists. Like, I'm here to tell you from the insurance company, we do negotiate with terrorists. We do negotiate with criminals. Uh, and down in the States, uh, it's not illegal to pay ransoms yet. Um, and so, you know, if you find yourselves afflicted by one of these ransomware attacks where um, you're not able to come back from it easily, um, pretty much that's the choice you have is pay criminals and participate in criminal activity or uh, for small businesses a lot of times the, the alternative would be to die right to have this attack turn out your lights for good as a business um, and so we're that's a big part of what we do is to try to uh, mitigate that risk and help people through it absolutely and one of the parts about you know it, like you said it's not illegal to pay a ransom however there are some things in facing the, uh, the US that or certain groups get sanctioned by the federal government, and it is illegal to pay a sanctioned entity. You can pay ransom, you can pay as long as you're not, you know, a sanctioned entity, someone that says we cannot pay. And they are two traditionally ones that are, you know, nation state threat actors, that are ones that are associated with them, uh, that we already know that they're, they're doing things for bad. So, and obviously there's a lot of threat actors that do things for bad, but again, you know, these are ones that are, are listed on the sanctions list, then we would not be able to pay a ransom. So what do these attacks cost? Um, we have a case study we're gonna go through here in a little bit, but our average for a claim for ransomware is about $140,000. Um, so it's talking about recovery here. Um, when one of these attacks goes down, there's actually several parts of the expense. Uh, not all of them are covered by insurance, but uh, all of them would be you know, attributable to, to the victim. So you have your uh, forensic investigation up front, basically figuring out root cause and what happened and things like that. Um, you've got ransom payment, if, if you're gonna have to pay one, that can be anywhere from tens of thousands up into the millions, depending on you know, who you are as a company and, and what type of insurance cover you have. Um, and then recovery is another piece there. Recovery is like the cost to put the environment back to its normal state and restore normal operations. That tends to be the single biggest expense of these attacks, not counting ransom payments, uh, because you gotta think in some cases, you're a small business, you're having to re-architect your entire technology environment, um, build new backups, move to things to the cloud. Uh, not only are you trying to put things back the way they were, which if you think about it, that's kind of stupid, right? The way you were was what got you into trouble in the first place. Um, you wanna put them back hopefully in a way that's a little bit more resilient than it was before. Um, and so you can very rapidly get into the six figures for expenses there. So 17% here, chance that a victim a business will be the victim of a ransomware attack. Um, for my experience, uh, working everywhere from like big Fortune 500 and working all over the world, I would say for large businesses, for enterprises, the average is about once every two to three years for a major breach of some kind. Um, for small to medium businesses, the, the um, sort of life between attacks tends to be a little bit longer. Um, but that varies quite a bit, right? This is not like operating a casino in the sense that um, you know, from year to year, the uh, statistics and probabilities remain unchanged. 
Um, one of the things that makes cyber insurance uh, such a difficult market to be in is the fact that the threat landscape changes. You know, when you buy homeowner's insurance, uh, your house really doesn't change, right? Uh, you're not suddenly gonna be uh, near a volcano that's active, you know, six months in your policy. That kind of change doesn't happen. But for cyber, it's different. Uh, you know, we might write a policy on January 1st for a company that looks great to us from a risk perspective, and then two months later, somebody comes up with a new vulnerability, a new set of vulnerabilities, new malware, uh, you know, nation state activity happens, maybe somebody invades their neighbor and, you know, has a, has a war that changes the threat landscape. Um, and so we really have to stay on top of this and um, really track these risks from month to month and year to year. And, and, you know, that's why we have a security team at an insurance company is because once we write those policies, we own that risk. Um, and it's very much incumbent upon us to, to keep on top of it. Okay, so what are we talking about here today? Top five risks for our businesses that, that we write policies for. 80% of our attacks uh, for which we pay claims result from one of these issues. And I've given some version of this talk um, several times over the years. Obviously it changes from, from year to year, uh, but I'm always surprised uh, at the reaction I get, especially when I'm talking to security professionals, because I'll hear people look at this and, and they'll say like, well, I mean, this is like motherhood and apple pie, right? Of course you should be patching your system. Of course you should be you know, having good backups. Yes, that is true. To a security professional, some of this stuff is kind of boring and, and not necessarily um, um, exciting. We're gonna talk through details here. I think it is a little bit more unexpected than you might think, uh, but the reality is, People are not getting knocked over by uh, you know, elite super Russian crime groups or the KGB, you know, all this stuff that people are shrieking and waving their arms about in the press. Like, they're getting knocked over by relatively low-skilled attackers in a lot of cases, uh, and the way that those low-skilled attackers are finding ways in is because of things like unpatched vulnerabilities, like something that has been known about uh, for years in some cases uh, that went unpatched unnoticed. Um, US government releases a list of, um, should I go to the next slide for this? Um, US government releases a list of the top, top 10 most exploited vulnerabilities um, every year. This comes from uh, the CISA, um, Center for Infrastructure Security. Um, up until last year, um, the list still had a vulnerability on it from 2017. Right, so five years went by where attackers were continuing to feast on this one vulnerability that everybody knew about, there was a patch for, and just nobody, nobody did anything about it. Um, what that causes for attackers is basically, you know, we, we go in and we do these investigations and we see that like, oh man, this looks like a really, you know, low skill attacker. Like they didn't need their, their A game, they brought their B game and their C game and they used commodity malware. Um, but people draw the wrong conclusion from that, right? They, they look at that and they say like, oh, okay, well this attacker wasn't that skilled and the threat really isn't there, but that's all wrong, right? The reality is like they didn't need to bring their A game because they still found all of these unpatched vulnerabilities. Um, anybody heard the term log4j? Yeah, I see a couple of north and south. Okay, this was like a really big deal for insurance, right? This is, Larry and I were still um, at our last job at our incident response company. And when this vulnerability was announced, um, I guess about a year and a half ago now, um, everybody, it was like the world was lit on fire for a few months, right? All of the insurance companies that we work with were uh, calling us and asking us like on a weekly basis, hey guys, how many Log4j exploits have you seen? How many Log4j exploits have you seen? This is a, if you haven't heard of this, this is a vulnerability that um, was integrated into like 80% of the software connected to the internet. Like every web server, every web page had this like Java-based package built into it that enables something, something very mundane, logging, like create logging of activity and things like that. Well, of course, developers are gonna go use this. It's like off-the-shelf software, so it became very prevalent. But when somebody found a vulnerability in it, like suddenly 80% of the internet is, is vulnerable to this thing. But the interesting thing was, we didn't see any exploits on Log4j, literally for months, for months. So here's this thing that's out there. Every, you know, it's like if every one of your neighbors in your neighborhood left their front door wide open for two months 
and, and like nobody got burglarized through the front door. Um, but again, the reality here was attackers already have so much stuff to use. There's so many doors and windows already open. You know, if every door and window in your house, except for one, is already open, and then I go and I open that last one, has the risk profile really changed? Not really, right? Um, so this is a significant issue. Um, this, is, this is one of a very small set of things uh, that will cause us to not write insurance for somebody. Is like, hey, you have like unpatched vulnerabilities. Um, nevertheless, you know, we still see fully 12% uh, of our incidents for which we pay a claim uh, that feature some vulnerability exploit here. So the takeaway is patch, just patch, right? Um, and this is the thing that people are like, oh, it's motherhood and apple pie. It is, but people aren't doing it. So thing number one, just patch. If you patch, are you gonna be uh, closing the door to every attacker? No, not necessarily. Uh, but you do significantly mitigate your risk to the, uh, we'll say the, the proverbial like kid in his mom's basement, right? These low skilled attackers who don't have software development capabilities, like aren't <laughs> gonna go buy exploits from criminals. Um, and so there is a significant amount of uh, risk mitigation you get. Um, this one's kind of interesting because it's, uh, it's a little bit insidious. Um, you know, we, we have a policy that, uh, where we require our insureds to uh, basically to hide all of their remote access tools from the open internet. Um, so when I say remote access, I'm talking about like remote desktop, um, VPN connections, if you use a VPN for work. Um, there's a lot of other ones out there. Splashtop is one. Um, OpenVNC is another one. There's all these different tools you can use to get there. Um, What's the other one? Go to my PC that's been out there since like the 90s. Okay, so um, what makes this insidious is that attackers um, don't tend to use like custom built back doors much anymore. We don't see that a lot. Um, something that would be picked up by antivirus or um, like endpoint protection. What we, see, uh, what we see instead are attackers using like these off the shelf commercially available uh, remote access tools like Splashtop, for example. So um, if you are an IT system administrator, you know, you work on the IT team for your company or um, you have like a managed service provider who manages all your computers and stuff, they're probably using one of these tools. And that's why attackers like to use them too, because they're not malware. They're not malicious software. They're plain old ordinary pieces of software that people tend to have uh, in their environment. And so I can go in as an attacker and I can install you know, splash top, it's not gonna get picked up by any security, and basically maintain access long-term. Um, in some cases, you can maintain access indefinitely, right? Um, we'll talk, we've got a page later on where we talk about like the ransomware ecosystem, um, but, but when you get afflicted with ransomware, uh, in a lot of cases, you're not dealing with one attacker, you're dealing with multiple attackers um, who have like <coughs> done different parts of the kill chain where one guy got the access, Another guy, you know, built the malware and licensed it out. We'll talk about it. Um, but the takeaway here is to ensure that you're controlling um, remote access for your environment. Um, use use disallow lists. So, for example, if if you know that your environment isn't supposed to have any of these tools, then you can like add them to a disallow list for your security tools to make sure that they get detected when they're there. Um, uh, but controlling remote access is a pretty pretty key risk mitigator. Okay. Um, stolen credentials. Um, has anybody here ever gotten a letter in the mail uh, from their bank, their credit card company, uh, somebody you used your credit card with telling you that, hey, so sorry, we lost your account details. We lost your credentials. Maybe if you had a Yahoo email account way back when, um, you got an email from Yahoo a couple of years back. Nobody? Okay, we got a couple, all right. so. Yeah, I mean, stolen identity, stolen credentials. Um, interestingly, your full identity now on the black market, including like social security number if you're in the States, um, equivalent identifying numbers in other countries, name, address, things like that. Your full identity is only worth about $20 on the black market, which you wouldn't you would think, right? Somebody, they take your identity, they're gonna do a lot more damage to you than $20. The reason they're worth so little is because everybody's identity in a, in a digitally connected society has been breached so many times and stolen so many times that it's like a commodity, 
right? Credentials, usernames and passwords are a big part of that. Um, we actually see uh, fairly often instances where uh, people have had their environment breached um, by somebody using legitimate credentials. Like, hey, I, didn't, I stole somebody's username and password, or somebody put it into some source code that got put onto public GitHub and I found it there. Or in some cases, it's an insider who has you know, disgruntled, uh, they're mad at the company and they went out and sold their credentials. Um, and so we, we see this fairly often. Uh, the way that we deal with this is we require multi-factor authentication. Um, so we require people to deploy like Okta or Duo, uh, um, Google Authenticator, things like that. Um, because the problem here is that if I have credentials and I log into your environment, none of your security tools are going to see me. None of them. I look like I'm an authenticated user, right? Everything I do is going to look totally normal and legitimate, and um, I'm going to be able to probably deploy a piece of ransomware or steal data and you know, nobody's ever going to see anything. So multi-factor authentication is the takeaway here. Um, doesn't, doesn't stop everything, uh, but it is very effective at mitigating the risk that stolen credentials will be used. Okay, this is an area of active research for us. Um, given the fact that ransomware, which is the biggest thing that we worry about, um, is, a, is a data destroying uh, piece of malware, um, you know, what we thought for a while was that, hey, if you have good backups, you're actually gonna be able to just not pay and you know, delete all the bad data and restore the good data from your backups. Makes sense, right? Um, well, as it turns out, of the 90% of our insureds who claim to have uh, good backups, uh, the way that we define them, um, only about 22% of them are able to recover effectively from, from incidents. So like, what's going on here? Why are these backups not working? So we are actively researching this. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why we have speculated this could be. Um, configuration problems, like hey, is your backup system actually like covering the data that you care about? Like for example, are you backing up things like uh, invoices and customer contact information? Like you might wanna save the data of people who owe you money, right? So you can remember to bill them. Um, that's a big problem. Um, other issues include like, hey, we have a good backup system, but we stopped paying the bill six months ago, and so it stopped working and nobody noticed. Um, or Bob, the backup guy, uh, went to a new job three months ago and we didn't replace Bob, and so either the system doesn't work anymore because it's sort of drifted out of compliance, or uh, nobody knows how to use it now, so even if it works properly, like we can't make it do what it's supposed to do. Um, so there's a lot of issues here. We're actually about to do a, a webinar series where we talk about this and talk people through like 30 minutes on just backups, like how to make sure your backups are gonna work. Um, but what I would advise to you is like, make sure you have something, make sure it's cloud-based and to the extent possible, make sure it's um, has an, an offline component, you know, where it's not connected all the time to your environment. Because we do see instances of ransomware that specifically target backups. Um, this last one here, we actually uh, have some handouts here in the back that uh, my colleague Rico has, has set out. Um, we put out a report a few months ago about email security. 41% of attacks used a malicious email. Right? Everybody has heard of phishing, everybody has probably done uh, their company's version of uh, anti-phishing training, like don't take, click the dirty links, don't open the dirty files, etc. cetera. Um, education and training works great, but if I send your company uh, a mass email with an attachment that says 2023 salary increases. Uh, it doesn't matter how much training you've had, somebody's gonna open that thing, right? Um, and so what we did with our email security report, you know, given that we're paying out so many incidents related to email security issues, um, is we went and we uh, evaluated all of the email security solutions that our insureds have. So these are, if you're familiar with this space, it's products like Mindcast and Proofpoint. Um, you know, there's a whole slate of these tools that purport to like scan email for, for malware and phishing and things like that. Um, other people have done this research, it's out there. Um, the interesting thing that, uh, about our research is that uh, it's based on actual incidents. You know, if you go get this from like Gartner or Forrester, a lot of what you're getting is, you know, what they think and feel about these solutions. And uh, ours is not uh, vulnerable to what I would call the um, steak dinner attack uh, from vendors. Uh, 
who am I kidding? I'm vulnerable to state dinner and tennis. But <laughs> uh, I did not do the research though. So what we have in our report is actually a, a ranking of the effectiveness of these solutions. Um, what we found is that the best thing that you can do is go to the cloud. You know, I could stand here all day and tell you to deploy Mindcast, which was the top performing solution, um, if you want to get your risk down. But even better than that is just move your email to the cloud. Go, go to G Suite, go to Microsoft 365. Um, and that resulted in, in some cases, a better risk reduction than actually trying to make a deliberate effort to secure your email. So that's a big push we're working on now is trying to get our insureds to get out of the on-prem email business. If you want to read that report, we have copies in the back. Um, yeah, and we also have, a, I think, a link here at the end that you can scan if you don't want the paper version. Um, so what we're going to do here is go through a, a, uh, a case study that Larry is going to talk us through. Um, before we do that, though, I just want to uh, double click on something I brought up earlier. So a lot of people don't realize that you know, the, the ransomware ecosystem is like a whole criminal value chain, right? Um, we, we look, we hear about these uh, criminal groups like the, the Conti ransomware group and the Klopp ransomware group and the Black Cat ransomware group, um, and we hear about them like like they're you know the mafia, like they're some big giant monolithic you know criminal enterprise. That's actually not how it works. Um, you have a couple of different players here. Um, these initial access brokers are the ones that most people haven't heard about. Um, this is a class of criminals whose whole purpose in life is to just go out and establish access. And so they do this in a lot of different ways. Um, buying or stealing credentials is one way. So they might go out and you know, put like a key logger piece of malware in your environment and collect up everybody's password. And then that's it, they don't do anything else. Um, they'll take that access and go and sell it on the black market later. Um, a lot of this activity is done by botnets. Um, so you know, you'll have botnet for hire groups that actually go out and harvest credentials uh, as well. So. Um, they're able to do uh, quite a bit of value and add quite a bit of threat here without really exposing themselves to law enforcement and security. Um, although in the United States it is illegal to traffic in credentials, uh, most places around the world it's not. So these folks are actually not criminals in a lot of places where they operate. Um, the second group here are the ransomware groups themselves. Um, what distinguishes these folks is that they tend to be software developers. Right, so these are the groups that actually build the pieces of ransomware, the malware that you encounter. Um, it's not illegal to build ransomware, believe it or not, uh, anywhere that I am aware of, certainly not in the United States. If you're a software developer, you can build all the malware you want. Um, I think you can even sell it, and uh, that does not make you a criminal. Obviously, being involved in an ongoing criminal enterprise, that is illegal, but you know, building computer viruses and malware um, isn't on its own illegal. And so, you know, here again, you have a set of people who are probably able to operate openly. Um, the Conti ransomware group famously has an office in St. Petersburg in Russia. They go to work and they sit in a cubicle, uh, just like a lot of people here do. Um, they even post job openings on, you know, Russian, Russian uh, Indeed or whatever it is they have over there. And so. Um, what they are doing in Russia is actually not a crime, so they can operate. The third group here is the ones that you probably encounter if you have one of these attacks, right? These affiliates. These are franchises, essentially. Um, and if you think about the parts of the attack that these first two groups are handling, what these guys actually do doesn't require any skill, right? All I need is money. I can go buy credentials from the first group, so I don't need to do any hackery to actually get into your environment in the first place. Then I can go rent a piece of ransomware from the second group, right? Probably have to pay some royalties or something like that, but not every group requires that. And so I've got the access, I've got the malware, all I have to do is use it and deploy that malware. And then um, we even have other groups involved that do things like negotiations and harassment for hire if you don't want to pay, things like that. So, this is a whole criminal enterprise that, that you're potentially interacting with. Um, so Larry, you want to talk us through the, the case here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to kind of set the stage a little bit as far as this, um, well, thank you. Uh, as far as this case study that we did. This was an actual case that we, Adam and I worked, um, it was last year I believe it was, uh, probably one of the biggest ones that we worked in 2022. Uh, it kind of sets the stage a little bit as far as the company is concerned. This is a, uh, it's a hundred million dollar company. Uh, it's a e-discovery company uh, in the U.S. Uh, they uh, they don't have everything what seemed to be correct. 
they had a CISO in their environment, they had an IT director, uh, they had you know all of, all the tools that you know you would normally see EDR solutions uh, that were deployed in the environment. Everything seemed like it was done correctly. You would think it was done correctly when you look at it from the outside. However, as you know, security doesn't have to be expensive to be effective, and some of the basic controls were not put into play, as you'll see through this case study, that will show that if they would have deployed some of the smaller uh, you know, the security controls, it could have prevented or at least stopped or uh, and mitigated somewhat portions of the attack. So this is an e-discover company. They have over 200 terabytes, I think it was somewhere around 270 terabytes worth of data. Now this is a data that's related to ongoing matters, like, you know, uh, legal stuff. You know, you've probably heard of what e-discover, you know what e-discover is. Uh, this is data that they've collected over the years and their engagements that may be at some point a potential litigated down the road. Uh, so they had this huge amount of data spread over different places. They had a redundant backup set up uh, using two different systems set up in their environment. And you would think by looking at that, all that would be good. Uh, but so you're only as good as your weakest link for the most part, right? So uh, in this case, we've done the investigation and during the investigation, we discovered <laughs> that one individual, one individual, received uh, a, a phishing email. Now granted, there was a lot of phishing emails that was sent out, I'm sure, to that company over a period of time. Uh, but all it takes is one person clicking on the link and getting access to uh, the, uh, the, the phishing link and entering their credentials, in, credentials into uh, the platform. And you would think, if you, like you would, uh, Adam would just say, and if you had an email that comes in and talks about, you know, your salary increases, and you clicked on it, and it's like, okay, log into your HR system, and blah blah blah, will give you some, you know, some more details, and then you enter your credentials in, and you're thinking everything is just fine. But this is kind of what we see a lot of here lately uh, is some of the basic controls not put into play. When I say basic controls. Uh, it, having some form of having MFA deployed is one of the bigger ones. You know, not having the MFA can reduce the attack quite a bit, but it will also, there are ways of bypass MFA, but now we can talk about that more. But did, does anybody use LastPass? <laughs> okay, you shouldn't have raised your hand. Shouldn't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a LastPass hater. Uh, I'm sure they're a great company, but LastPass. This is publicly known, you can look at it on Wikipedia. They have been breached more than 10 times in the past 10 years. Like, and why wouldn't, why wouldn't they be breached, right? If everybody in the world is gonna put all their passwords in one place, like, why would LastPass not be the juiciest, bestest target for an attacker to ever go after? And that is actually what has happened over the past 10 years. Absolutely, and once they get access to the environment, there's ways that they can continue to get into the environment through elevated, privilege, elevated privileges and other ways once they get access to the environment. However, you know, some basic controls put into play could help mitigate some of that, like we talked about MFA. But sometimes the failure of deploying MFA, especially in this case, there was no uh, MFA nor any email security applied whatsoever. So that gave, you know, the third actor access to the environment. Um, obviously, once the third actor got access to the environment, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to start deploying a, their, their own tooling. And as Adam said earlier, there's tools that they can get uh, and download that, that they're legitimate tools that uh, pen testers use, uh, that other people use for certain tax, uh, uh, tactics to get into the environment, uh, like collecting passwords in the environment. There's, there's legitimate tools for that. Now, granted, in the hands of a threat actor, they can use these tools to be able to uh, do uh, nefarious things. So, they, they can, in, in this particular case, they downloaded a uh, Cobalt Strike, and inside of that, they were able to download additional tooling that gave them the ability to beacon out to their uh, to their website or to their, their their location where they can expel data from the environment. Uh, they use a credential, they compromise credentials to target their backups, there's backups in there, especially there's there's a thing, uh, as you probably uh, may know, that uh, uh, account lease privileges. So if you are a user, you should not have access to a backup. But a lot of times the backups are available to others to use. 
uh, or to log into they don't limit the uh, the access and then by that uh, it gave the threat actor the ability to log in into the environment and, um, uh, and and hit those high value targets like backups which they all uh, mostly do uh, and if you had a properly configured antivirus software Cobalt Strike obviously would be in this case would have probably detected on that now there was an EDR solution in play on this and I will talk a little bit about it the EDR solution uh, was one of your top uh, solutions that was employed but it was not monitored by anyone and the uh, it hadn't been updated in probably a year uh, the actual uh, deployment was probably not done completely in the environment as well and there was indicators that uh, what, what had popped up on this that showed hey Cobalt Strike was being used hey this tool was being used but nobody was monitoring so there was no ability to stop it uh, from attacking so uh, it was not bought by any of that um, and as you know once and I, I call it the uh, opportunist where they there there is an access and he was talking about your windows open your back doors open front doors open then why would I want to go to a, uh, the house down the road when everything is locked up I'm gonna go in your house your house is open wide, uh, wide open so I'm gonna go in it and then the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna look around for valuable targets if you think of this as a, uh, um, a burglar you know why would I go and burglarize the neighbor's house I'm gonna burglarize the house but I can open the front door and walk in and I'm going to grab jewelry and high value things that I can get the most out of and then prevent me from being traced the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do what they call burn down the house so as I walk out a lot of match stole on the floor and it burned down the house now you, I, I've kind of stopped my tracks from or being discovered by someone else I've got uh, my your jewelry and I'm, I got, I'm out the door with it and I'll burn the house down for a minute being attacked the same way with a, a ransomware attack First thing they're going to do is get access using the tooling. They're going to go in, start looking for high value targets like backups, personal data, PHI, PII data from the environment, and they're going to expel that out. And when I say they're going to have using their own software, they're going to get access and they're going to take that data out of your environment. And then the next thing before they're going to do is they're going to I call burn down the house. They're going to uh, take and deploy ransom or the ransomware area in the environment and encrypt the data. And when they encrypt the data, then they're also going to target your backup so they encrypt, especially if it's online, uh, where they can access it and they're going to encrypt that as well. Yeah, one, one thing about this case that made it kind of interesting uh, is the fact that this company was in the process of moving offices, like moving physical locations. And so they had two redundant backup systems and then they had the, those two systems duplicated at a second office. So they essentially had four backup systems in place. But because their endpoint protection solution, their, essentially their antivirus, uh, didn't, didn't take any action when it detected malware, um, it was like 20 days or something before the ransomware actually kicked off. And what ended up happening was that was plenty of time for these backup solutions to capture like malware uh, in the backups to where they no longer had a clean backup that they could roll back to. All of them were tainted. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to try to speed through this because we're running a little bit out of short of time. So uh, we were doing the no negotiation with this particular threat actor. was able to negotiate their price down uh, a little, and we was able to uh, get a decryptor from a threat actor. Obviously, the containment wouldn't taken wouldn't done uh, to contain the threat actor in the environment. So the decryptor was basically useless in this case. Uh, it was actually deployed on a database that, or a, a system that was still encrypted. So when we applied the decryptor, it's kind of a never-ending state. So the decryptor was decrypting as the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the malware on it was de encrypting, and then they started back over again. So it was a never-ending process. So it, basically it was not effective. Contrary to proper belief, a decryptor is not a magic bullet. You cannot take and buy a decryptor uh, and, and it just magically in, in, decrypt your environment. Most cases, and not all of them, there's a issue with the decryptor being able to actually decrypt the environment. So uh, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to just um, decrypt it and move on. So the, the in this case, there was six weeks of hard downtime. Think about it, if you're on a business and you're complete, you're, all your systems are completely down and you have no way of, of operating your business or your computers or you contact your clients 
because as you said, your 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 bid, your your invoices, all that's locked up. You can't get access to. You don't even know who to contact. Being down for six hard weeks, an additional two months to get back up to where uh, they're they're full recovered. Uh, they paid one million in ransom uh, to this particular threat actor for the decryptor that won't work, and then they also have a little over five hundred thousand in additional recovery and instant response and things like that. Uh, they also have significant loss in uh, market confidence in this e-discovery firm. Uh, there was multiple lawsuits. The CEO was contacting us like daily saying, hey, come down the lawsuit, can you help get this fixed, get it fast? And it just takes time. So, write it down. But, and there's also the, uh, the, the legal liabilities and business loss was still unknown on this particular case. But it almost destroyed a $100 million company. Uh, all this could have been prevented uh, if